Hi. Well, good morning. I love to see people take steps of faith. Rodney, thanks for sharing that story this morning. Our long-term goal with faith stories is not to just have them read in this service, but what I would love is for some of you to go on video so that we could share with all three services what God's doing and not, you know, I know you guys are special, but uh, there's two other services that people come to too. We want to share those stories with everybody. So Rodney, thank you for all you're doing to pull that together and one thing at a time. If you notice Steve and I out in the water, uh, seaweed and strong waves, it was very exciting, found out last Sunday afternoon that like they had to rescue like 50 people off of that beach. So I felt bad because I was kind of holding on to one of the kids, and then later when I saw that story, I'm like, I'm glad, because I almost felt like I did force baptism, but I didn't. It was, really wasn't, it wasn't Nacho Libre. Uh, if you caught that reference, you are ADD. All right, <clears throat> today we're going to talk about dealing with pain in prayer. We're ending up our series, finishing our series on James, James chapter 2, 26. By the way, more videos today, less sermon. So that's exciting for some of you. You're really glad about that. And the more I talk, the less sermon we get. But uh, there it is. Here's the series verse, James 2.26. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So let me just recap a few things from this series. Next week, we'll be starting a series on prayer. And uh, James, remember, was likely the er uh, earthly brother of Jesus. Uh, James is the first book written. It's written to Jerusalem Christians uh, Jews who became Christians before the fall of Jerusalem. So this is the very first book written. It ends very abruptly. Um, it's basics for living as believers and not being fake, not, uh, uh, not trying to be something. You're not to recognize that we need God's grace. When you read James and you read, read about the tongue, and he says, you know, the tongue's a fire. We've all been there. And if you're Southern, it's tongue's a fire. And, uh, you know, we've been there, and so it's this idea we really need God's grace in the middle of all this. So let me ask you this question. What was your main focus this week? What, what was the thing that you stayed up or woke up in the middle of the night worried about? Uh, what was the thing that you woke up in the morning and had on your mind? What was the person maybe that you were concerned about or the situation? So just reflect for a minute on this week. Maybe in your life it's pain, some type of pain, emotional, physical pain, or, or somebody else. Maybe somebody is a pain. Uh, it could be a frustration, um, and it could really be a person. Now let me ask you this question, though. What if this week you were so concerned about one thing that you missed what really mattered? What if you were so worried about one thing you missed what really mattered, like the family that was at Disney World behind me one time, we were watching an incredible show and they were arguing behind me over who got the pretzel. And they missed an amazing show. Years ago, believe it or not, I ran in the Disney Half Marathon 2012, which gets farther and farther in the rearview mirror. And so today I want to relate the idea of what really matters to this half marathon. When I first signed up for the half marathon, I didn't sign up. My friends signed me up. Well, I call them friends still, barely. Because my friend called me and said, Hey, Eric, we're going to do this, this, uh, this race. It is, and I quote, 10K. Now, I had run some 5Ks, which is about three miles, so I thought six miles, I probably can do that. So I got signed up. Months later, I was looking at something, and it said half marathon. And I went, what? 13.1 miles. By the way, you notice that point one. People are like, why do they put point one? Trust me, that point one, worst part of the race. So I realized I needed to start training for this because a 5K and a much more K are very different. And so if you don't know, you, you train, you, they, you actually print up what you want to run. So you start with maybe a mile or two miles and you run three miles a day and then you're running about five miles a day. And then at one point, about a week before the race, you're supposed to essentially run the full race. I remember that day because it was raining and it was miserable 
And I went out early in the morning to try to miss all that. And I remember my shoes were wet. And I didn't do 13. I did 11 miles. And I said, that's good enough, close enough. I can make 13 if I can make 11 in the rain. The morning of the race, it was 17 degrees. Let me just say that again. 17 degrees. And so um, you have to show up about 3 o'clock in the morning. And I'll never forget, we, we started the race and went through the race, and I'll talk a little bit about that during the message. But the truth is, at the end of the race, they gave me this. I had no idea I was even going to get this little, little Donald Duck thing. I said, you ran a race. But now I hang it on my wall to remember that I did something that took me forever one time. A year later, I was actually in the hospital and watched the beginning of the race from a hospital bed. That's a great motivation for exercise. What if during the race I decided that what I was doing wasn't that important and started doing something else? What if I decided, you know, Goofy's over there. By the way, they did have Goofy and all. What if I went over and said, I'm going to talk to Goofy for a half hour? See, in life, as you go through life, we have the goal of knowing God, growing with others. You know, the Bible gives us two main goals, love God and love people. But in life, we get distracted by all kinds of things that don't matter and pain is one of the big ones that can distract us from the things that matter so today we're going to talk about how to prayerfully deal with pain because life is a marathon and we're distracted so my prayer for you is that as you spend time in prayer prayer can change your perspective as we remember confess remember And then get with others to pray. God changes us and helps us to seek his will each day. So here's the first kind of pain. Pain caused by sin requires confession. I'm going to talk about this backpack in a second. Pain caused by sin requires confession. So let's pick up James chapter 5. We're going to go through there today. Now listen, you rich people. And everybody turns me off as soon as I say that. You don't realize that the truth is, uh, compared to the rest of the world, you're rich. Congratulations. If you're the poorest person in this world, compared to the, in this room, compared to the rest of the world, guess what? You're wealthy. Congratulations. Welcome to America. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that's coming on you. Your wealth is rotted. Moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Let's just go home now. Isn't that a wonderful, encouraging message for today? Now, what's he talking about? What was happening in the early church? Well, he's going to tell us, so hang in there. Here we go. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. Time out. What happened? They hired people and then didn't pay them. If you're a believer and you hire people and don't pay them, you need to read this verse about 17 times. Because he's saying, hey, hey, you're, you're not taking care of the people that God has put in your life. The very people you made a promise to. And then he continues. You've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. Boy, do we need to hear that in America. You've fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. Oh, boy. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. Now, I want to broaden this passage out a little bit because here's the deal. Most of us, when we read a passage like that, we love to say, well, I didn't do that. Well, I've never done that. Or we think of somebody who does that. Oh, I worked for a guy one time, never did get my bonus. Never did get, you know, they were supposed to pay me for my vacation time. Never did. I don't know why I'm saying that with a country accent, but it sounded good. We think of other people. So I want to talk about the ways that we often, in a country where we have so much, where we often choose to look for comfort. We choose to look for things that can keep us from God's best. So I want to, I want to show you a couple of those things. See, in the race, I would have never carried a backpack. Now, what's amazing about a 17-degree race is people drop clothes the whole race. 40,000 people raced with me. And as we were running, I noticed clothes everywhere. Why? Because it was 17 degrees. 
But as people ran, they got warmed up and they dropped the clothes. Disney actually donates all those clothes. People do it every year. I was unaware of this. Would have been nice to know ahead of time. Let me tell you some things that we do as people. You know, it's easy to look at other people and think, well, I don't do that. That doesn't really matter. Well, this verse talks about greed. Greed is any time we think that we've got to protect our stuff. Lest you think you don't have greed, is there anything you have a couple of just in case? Now, I'm not talking about being prepared. I'm not talking about being ready. I'm not talking about having 12 extra rolls of toilet paper now after last year, right? You got, right? Just in case, right? What happens? We start to trust in our stuff to take care of us, and we can move from trusting God to trusting our stuff. Some of us are our big deal, our big deal. We love, we just love relaxation. This is fishing worms. We love to go. We worship relaxation, sometimes to the point that we refuse to do what God wants us to do because we are spending time on ourselves. So we don't come to church anymore. We got things to do. We don't help with, with ministry anymore because we, we, you know, we just want to relax. We want to come to church, sit in a row, and look at people. By the way, church is not about sitting in a row and looking at the pastor. Although I know for some of you, that's just mortifying every week. Those of you who know me know I love gum. And one of the reasons I love gum is when you work at home and you study at home a lot, you can walk past the pantry and find food in your mouth and not even know you've grabbed it. Unless you have gum in your mouth. When you have gum in your mouth, you notice if you put a potato chip in there with it. For me, gum is about play. I love chewing gum. I love, man, I chew gum all day long. Now, I can't chew in front of you because I chew like a cow. So I have to get rid of the gum. If I don't get rid of the gum, people will be like, what is wrong with you? I don't know. I just chew like this. But in our world, pleasure has become our God. We love pleasure. We love things that bring us pleasure, pleasure and avoid pain. So oftentimes we don't do what God wants us to do because we just want to enjoy life. The other thing, we're, we love comfort. We love comfort. We love just being able to just, you know, relaxation, get to do what we want. So we don't go out of our way to help anybody. We don't go to, out of our way to bless anybody. We don't call anybody. We don't serve anybody. We don't check on anybody. Why? Because we just are enjoying our Netflix and our reclining chair. And why would I? Do you think when you get to the end of your life, you're going to say, Oh, I didn't get to watch that Netflix special. No. What we're going to be concerned about is, did I carry out what God wanted me to do today? I saw an email this morning, or I got a note this morning about a missionary, a guy who had served in the military who went to Haiti and just got back there after the pandemic to serve and as he and his wife were driving across Haiti to help some people, he was shot in the back and is now in the hospital in intensive care. He gave up his comfort and got hurt. Why? Because he said, God, I want to do what you want me to do regardless of the consequences. Too many times we worship all the things that are in this bag and we wonder why we're so distracted and so tired in life, why life doesn't really seem to matter anymore instead of saying, God, what do you want me to do? See, here's the deal. We look at this and we see this guy didn't pay his workers wages and we all get mad. Oh, who would do that? Here's the deal. God has given each of us gifts. And your gifts are meant to serve other people and meant to bless other people. Any time you don't use the gifts God's given you and use them to bless or go out of your way for others, you are withholding what God has given you from other people. And we should weep about that. And we should mourn about that. Churches should be packed today because Christians go out of their way for others. But too many churches are a show today where church people show up for entertainment and then go home and live like nothing ever happened. We should weep. We should mourn. We should wail because the very things we think are important are going to rot and rust and do no good. You know what will matter in eternity? The people you reached out to. The people you blessed. The times you used the gifts that God gave you. No matter how uncomfortable. So what do we do about that? First John 1.9 says it very simply. If we confess our sins... 
That just means being honest with God. By the way, confession is not saying, God, I did this yesterday. I'm planning on doing it tomorrow, but I just wanted to tell you about it in case you didn't notice. That's not confession. Confession is, God, I did this and I want to repent. Change me. Change me. If we confess our sins, what happens? He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Is there a step you need to take to step out of your comfort? One of the reasons I love playing the baptism video is you get to see people. Baptism is not comfortable. Did you know that? Have you noticed? Uh, My mom said, your hair looked awful in that video. I said, that's because we were whacked by waves over and over again. She said, you had a mohawk. I said, that's awesome. I said, you notice there was seaweed all over me too. And when people take steps of faith, it requires unselfishness. And when you step out, it's difficult and you struggle. But guess what God's called us to do? What will really make a difference when we step out? Is there any area of your life where God is calling you to step out and you're pushing back against him because of something in your backpack? Maybe it's time to surrender to him. Put the backpack away and you will enjoy the life God has given you. Number two, remember his faithfulness while waiting. Now, when I was running the race, you can look up my time. I think it's like 12.20 was my time per mile for 13 miles. I will tell you, I was running 12s consistently. I got to the Magic Kingdom. Now, they don't show you this online, but I can tell you because they sent me my times. I got to the Magic Kingdom, ran from Epcot to the Magic Kingdom. As I got to the Magic Kingdom, the sun was starting to come up. They were playing all the music. There were people standing down the roads. Uh, uh, You could hear It's a Small World. You could hear the Country Bear Jamboree. You could hear all the different rides as you go past. And as I was running past, it was awesome. I just just got, for the first time in my life, really kind of on this runner's high. And I ran out of the Magic Kingdom. And as I did, suddenly I felt low battery. When I looked later at my time, I ran a nine-minute mile through the Magic Kingdom. Now, I know some of you, nine-minute mile is not a big deal. But for fat guy, that's a big deal. So I got out of the Magic Kingdom and I went, I have no energy. And as I got out of the Magic Kingdom on the way to run back to Epcot, somebody was handing out. There was a whole group of people, whole line of people cheering people on because they knew this was a time for a lot of people because you're a little over halfway. And they handed me a Gatorade as I ran. And I drank that Gatorade. Oh, it tasted so good as it went into my lungs. (laughs) And I sounded like Suzanne. Suzanne, thank you for the illustration this morning of what it's like to choke. And I choked and and was trying to run. It was so bad that people on the side said, Are you okay, sir? That's how bad I look running, by the way. What happened? I got off track. I forgot what I was doing. I should have just not. I could have gone another 30 minutes without drinking something. Listen, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord is coming. By the way, how many of you love patience? Isn't that your favorite? See how a farmer waits for land to yield its valuable crop patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. Somebody told me this morning, that's what I'm waiting for because you should see my yard. Well, imagine if that was your food. You too, be patient, stand firm. Why? Because the Lord's coming is near. Now listen to what's next. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. I don't like that verse at all. Can we just take that out of the Bible? What happens when you're waiting on a time in your life, if you're going through pain, if you're going through struggle, what do you tend to do? You tend to complain about other people. I can't believe so-and-so did that. I can't remember. Grumble, right? It sounds like, grumbling sounds like grumbling, doesn't it? The judge is standing at the door. Now, I don't like that thought. I don't know if you've ever walked in on somebody talking about you, but if you haven't, you're not a pastor. Because a number of times I've walked in a room and all of a sudden they go... The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience and the faith of suffering, take the patience, excuse me, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. And then it says, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And then listen to this. Above all, don't swear by heaven, earth, anything else. All you need to say is yes or no, otherwise you'll be condemned. Now, let me talk about that last verse real quick. It's not saying you can't sign a contract. It's saying you don't need to pretend to be spiritual to keep your word. 
It's like those people who put a fish on their business card to pretend they're a good Christian, and then you have them do business for you, and you realize that fish is just there for show. He's saying, hey, do what you say. But here's the big deal in all this. What's James saying to do? Remember what God has done. When you're going through a time of testing, when you're going through a time of trial, he says, remember the prophets, remember what he's done in the Bible. But can I tell you something simpler for you and me? Remember what he's done for you. You're all here today, so I assume you made it. God, thank you that I made it to today. I'm sure there was a time that you woke up and you thought, I'm not going to make it. Whatever that meant, spiritually, physically, financially, emotionally, I'm not going to make it. Well, guess what? You're here. You made it. God, thank you that I've made it this far. Now, you may not feel like you're going to make it till tomorrow. But what do we do? We look back and we thank God for what he's given us. You ever take time to just thank God for what you have? You ever take time to thank God for the people he's put in your life? Did you know what my favorite things to do? I'm a very visual learner. So I can usually, like if I look out today, I can remember where you sat and thank God for you later in the week. That's how weird I am. And so this week at some point, I'll thank God. Especially when I start thinking, I can't believe I said that during church. Because I do that. I get home, oh, I can't believe I said that one. Probably should have said this instead, right? You ever do that? What do you do instead? God, thank you for the people you've put in my life. God, thank you for providing for me. God, I didn't actually run out of toilet paper. I thought I was going to this year, right? Psalms 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Now, you probably don't think I can do the rest of this sermon in three minutes. You're absolutely right. Here we go. Number three, <laughs> join with others to grow and be healed. So we're going to skip to this verse. Randy already set me up. We're going to skip to this verse. That's right here. That Cherie's going to... Push up next, right. Now, there it is. All right. Therefore, well, that's not it. That's okay. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you may be healed. This is all I want to talk about in point number three. Now, I know people love to talk about physical healing. That's our favorite. We love physical healing. And we wonder, God, why don't you heal the way I want you to sometimes? I don't have time to go into all that today. But if you ever want an explanation or a question about that, I'd be glad to talk to you. What is this saying? There are times in life when you're struggling that the best thing you can do is to go to somebody and say these words, I'm struggling. I'm struggling physically. Maybe I'm struggling emotionally. Maybe I'm struggling with a person. Maybe I'm struggling with a lack of forgiveness. And I need you to pray for me. And by the way, you don't have to go to the pastor. Do you see the word pastor in there? You're welcome to come to the pastor. But guess what? You can pray too for each other. And let me tell you what happens when you pray for each other. You get healed. See, we normally only think of that as physical, but the truth is when you and I humble ourselves and we come to somebody and say, I'm struggling in this area, would you pray for me? And by the way, I encourage you when somebody does that, stop right where you're at, take a minute to pray. Let me tell you how to pray for somebody. If somebody comes to me and says, Eric, I'm really struggling with losing weight. Hang on. Lord, would you help them lose weight? Amen. It doesn't have to be any longer than that. You don't need to pray for the missionaries in South America. You just pray for what they ask. Eric, I'm really struggling with my teenager. That's a real common one I get all the time. I got a text this morning from somebody saying, hey, I'm at the hospital with my friend who's having surgery. Would you lift them up? Guess what I did right then? I lifted them up. Take time to pray for each other. Just humbling ourselves sometimes and saying, would you need help? Listen, you need other people. This verse talks about prayer. It talks about singing together. When you're with people, take time to be honest with them about what God's doing in your life, and He will heal you. When I look back at my life, and I see those seniors, and I realize that each of those seniors, I got to, to be in a piece of their life at some point, whether it was a mission trip, whether it was going to their house for something, whether it was visiting their dad at the hospital, one of them, whether it was being involved in a child dedication, I realize those are the connections in life that really matter. Are you investing in anybody's life? Are you allowing God to change you as you get really involved with other people? I encourage you to do that. That's what James was encouraging the early church to do. Because the only way that you won't be plastic is when you confess to one another. 
when you're honest with a friend and you say, this is an area I struggle. Would you pray for me? If you're here today or you're watching online, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. If you're here today and as I talk, there was an area that you said, you know what, I need to take a step of faith in that area, just agree to do that. I'll be here after the service to talk to you. If you're watching online, you can send me a note. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian, to surrender your life to Christ so that he can give you a brand new life inside. Let's close in prayer today. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for all you're doing in our church. And Father, we also, on this Memorial Day weekend, want to thank you for all those who sacrificed so that we could be here as a church in freedom. Lord, I know right now there's churches meeting secretly in China right now where people are risking their lives just to meet together. And Father, we take for granted this assembly, but so we thank you, Lord, that we can gather and we thank you for all those who've gone before us so that we can. Father, I pray today, if anyone here doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender their lives to you. And Lord, we all have areas of our life where, just like the rich person, we grow comfortable. We get to the point that we don't want to step out in faith. Father, I pray that we could get a few people around us that could encourage us to grow in our faith. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.